Authorities in North Carolina first started to get suspicious in 2018. That's when they noticed two odd things near the city of Fayetteville. First, there was an unusually large number of cigarettes being sold in the area, far more than could be explained by local demand. Second, police were stopping a number of vehicles along the local interstate highway that were carrying cash, lots of cash. The investigation led authorities to a plain gray brick building. This is where investigators say it all started. This business behind me here is called Freeco. It's listed on Google as a candy business, but authorities say what was coming out of here wasn't candy. It certainly wasn't. What authorities unearthed in Fayetteville last year was one of the largest cigarette smuggling rings of its kind. Authorities seized about $840,000 in cash, 11 vehicles, and 400,000 cartons of cigarettes and five guns. More than two dozen people were arrested in connection with the $12 million operation. So why is there so much money in moving cigarettes across state borders? Why would someone in New York even want to buy the exact same cigarettes from North Carolina that they can buy at home? And most importantly, how did we get in this mess in the first place? The answer, as we shall see, involves a potent combination of taxes, war, and big business. But most of all, the rampant cigarette smuggling in America today is the unintended product of good intentions. And if you're looking for someone to blame, you could accuse everyone from the smuggler to the tobacco industry to the tax collector. But before you point any fingers, let me first tell you a little story about the YMCA. I'm Sean Braswell. Welcome to Flashback, a history podcast from Aussie. This season, we are diving deep into some of the most remarkable and unsettling examples of unintended consequences from history. In this episode, we'll see how an enormous act of virtue by the YMCA, more than a century ago, continues to lead to all manner of vice, including that cigarette smuggling operation in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The reason that criminal operations like the one in Fayetteville exist is pretty simple. The federal government imposes a tax on cigarettes. That's a dollar and one cent per pack. Thomas E. Hall is an emeritus economics professor at the University of Miami, Ohio, and the author of Aftermath, The Unintended Consequences of Public Policies. But it doesn't matter where you buy them in the United States, you're going to pay the federal tax. Uh, what differs are the state taxes. And the state taxes on cigarettes vary a great deal. Some states are low-tax states. Some, like New York, are not. The state of New York adds a tax of $4.35 to a pack of cigarettes. Then the city of New York uh, also taxes them. They add an additional $1.50 onto a pack of cigarettes. So that means if you bought a pack of cigarettes in New York City, uh, there's $5.85 of taxes on a pack. Or close to $60 of tax per carton. North Carolina, on the other hand, collects only about $5 in tax per carton. I may be a history buff, but even I can do that math. Smugglers can make up to $55 per carton selling North Carolina cigarettes in New York. And if each truck of black market cigarettes carries about 50,000 cartons, then you are talking about $2.7 million in potential profit per truck. $2.7 million per truck. So you can see what's going on here. You have this, this profit opportunity. To say the least, there's more than just an opportunity. There's an easily moved commodity. Cigarettes are a product that are very easy to move around because they're, they're light, um, they're small, and they're durable. This sort of tax arbitrage opportunity can play out even within a radius of a few miles. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Cincinnati, Ohio is a river town. It's on the Ohio River. And across the river is the state of Kentucky. Now, Kentucky is a tobacco grower. Uh, there's a big crop down there. So needless to say, the Kentucky state legislature has an interest in keeping its tobacco farmers happy. Now, that means that the taxes on tobacco are not as high in Kentucky as they are in Ohio. In fact, it's a difference of about 50 cents a pack. Which means if you're a smoker in Cincinnati, all you have to do to save 50 cents for a pack of cigarettes, or $5 for a carton, is drive across the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge to Kentucky. And when you cross one of those bridges, uh, you'll find one liquor and tobacco store after another uh, right there by the river. 
But the real opportunity for smugglers is moving cigarettes from a low-tax state like North Carolina, where I live, and a high-tax one like New York. I asked Hall if I should be getting in on the action. If you could keep the uh, mafia off your back, you could make one hell of a lot of money uh, moving cigarettes up to New York. It's a dangerous business, though. I guess I'll pass. So how did we get in this bizarre tax situation in America? The U.S. first started taxing tobacco to help raise money for the Civil War, and they continued to do so after the war was over. Thomas Hall again. Essentially what the government discovered was that this was a great revenue raiser. By 1930, tobacco taxes were generating about 15% of the federal government's tax collections, $450 million of annual revenue, or about $7 billion worth today. And soon states wanted in on the action too. The first state cigarette taxes uh, popped up in the early 1920s, and the reason why they did was because we had a fairly bad recession from 1920 to 21, and during economic recessions, revenue to governments goes down. The states were trying to close their budget deficits, so they decided to start taxing cigarettes. In 1921, Iowa became the first state to enact a state-level cigarette tax. By the 1930s, more than 30 other states had followed. The original cigarette taxes were pretty low. We're just talking about a few pennies on a pack. Uh, but that's all it took uh, to get the uh, smuggling started, because once you impose higher taxes in one area than another, then you have this economic incentive to buy the cigarettes in the low-cost area and try to sell them in the high-cost area. Still, there wasn't a whole lot of money in smuggling cigarettes, yet. And most smugglers were still small-time criminals. Meanwhile, the popularity of cigarettes in America continued to soar. Even doctors recommended them. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, you heard that right. Then, in the mid-1960s, a landmark event occurred, one that would prompt several states to raise their cigarette taxes even higher. The reason why was because the famous Surgeon General's report of 1964 came out. This book? containing 387 carefully worded pages is a federal government report. It was released at noon today and it says, in view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That is the basic conclusion. That was a study that linked tobacco consumption to all kinds of health problems. And when that study came out, then people began to say, hey, you know, we ought to try to discourage smoking. It's very bad for people. And how can we discourage it? Well, one way is to raise the price of it by taxes. The Surgeon General in states like New York had good intentions to warn people about the harms of smoking and to price them out of it. But the price difference between states grew as a result. It was that wider differential in the prices that increased the profitability of smuggling, and that's when the organized crime figures got into it in a big way. And where did these smugglers see a unique opportunity? Nope, not North Carolina. Reservations. The Indian reservations are not required by law to assess the state taxes. And they, they govern their own territories, and they are not subject to the state laws. So a pack of cigarettes will show up on this Indian reservation in New York, and no state tax has been paid on it. So if, if Joe Consumer walks onto the reservation, they can buy a pack of cigarettes without paying the New York state tax. And so a reservation becomes a giant Costco for cigarettes. This one reservation in New York is the Puspatuck Reservation on Long Island. It's one square mile of territory, has 270 residents, and when somebody was looking into this about 10 years ago, they discovered that they had, in one year, imported 100 million packs of cigarettes. Overall, it's estimated that New York State loses nearly $1 billion in tax revenue per year because of cigarette smuggling. And experts say that governments lose more than $40 billion worldwide. But what makes it even worse? is where the money goes instead. There's a lot of profits to be had here. When there's a lot of profits to be had illegally, um, questionable characters will get involved in it. 
Remember the first bombing of the World Trade Center in New York back in 1993? The one where terrorists placed a truck bomb in the parking garage underneath the building? When the investigators went to the apartment of those, uh, those men who had done that dastardly deed, they found phony cigarette stamps in there. They were apparently involved in cigarette smuggling. That's just one example. The Irish Republican Army back in their heyday was uh, smuggling cigarettes. Uh, Saddam Hussein was a cig uh, cigarette smuggler. Uh, in fact, his son Uday was running the operation. It gets worse. They caught a guy up in New York a few years ago. He was uh, smuggling cigarettes and using the proceeds to fund uh, scholarships at terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. In the year 2000, smugglers involved in another $8 billion ring were arrested here in North Carolina. Where were they sending their profits? To the terrorist group Hezbollah. So the government decides to tax cigarettes. Different states tax them at different levels. And bam, smuggling becomes a multi-billion dollar industry. One whose proceeds can be seen everywhere from reservations to terrorist training camps. But that's only part of the story. The reason that cigarettes first became so popular in America and such a prime target for taxation by different states can be traced back to World War I. That's where this problem really starts and our story truly begins. Do you have an interesting tale about unintended consequences from history or your own life? Please share it with us by emailing flashback at ozzy.com. That's flashback at ozy.com. Cigarettes may be found by the truckload on some Native American reservations, but there's one place you don't see them nearly as much as you used to. And I remember it as a young lieutenant, you know, the, 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 and, and hearing the stories from some of the older guys about how everyone pretty much smoked in the military. This is Joel Bias, a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. He's also a professor at their Air Command Staff College. And you watch the movies or you watch documentaries or uh, you think back to World War II, et cetera, uh, just how different it is now. It's hard to find, especially an officer that smokes, especially smokes in uniform. Um, whereas 20, 30, 40 years ago in my business, it would be probably hard to find a person in uniform that didn't smoke cigarettes. Bias wrote a book called Smoke Em If You Got Em, The Rise and Fall of the Military Cigarette Ration. It looks at how the history of cigarettes in America is closely connected to the armed forces. Obviously, tobacco has a storied history in America, going back to the very beginning with the, the Mayflower and the Pilgrims and the early founders. Um, but for most of that 16, 17, 1800s, it was um, not manu what we call today a manufactured cigarette. And why weren't manufactured cigarettes all that popular in early America? Well, it's because it was seen as effeminate, meaning to smoke a cigarette was seen as something that a, a, a dandy would do. It wasn't seen as very masculine or manly to be smoking a cigarette. In fact, prior to World War I, cigars, pipes, and chewing tobacco, not cigarettes, were the predominant nicotine delivery devices in America. But it wasn't just effeminate cigarette smokers that were viewed differently by Americans. Soldiers were too. So when America entered the war against Germany in 1917 and started drafting young men to fight in it, there were lots of American mothers worried about what sort of morally compromising behavior their sons would encounter, even before they left camp for actual combat. And of course, the, the great concerns at the time for these progressives as they're bringing these millions of soldiers into camp and training them for war is the scourge of alcohol, prostitution, and idleness. The same Christian progressive temperance groups like the YMCA that would later help get prohibition passed in America set out to reform the business of war. And one of the great concerns of the, this movement was the, the ability of young men to be morally and physically healthy. And thanks to their lobbying, the U.S. Army prohibited alcohol near training camps, made sure that any brothels within 10 miles of a camp were shut down. Even the U.S. Secretary of War, Newton Baker, was involved. 
he gives a speech to, to mothers and about the draft and what's going on and says, I'm going to give your young men invisible armor. Uh, and you would think he might be talking about to save them from the, the death, you know, casualties in combat, shrapnel, etc. But no, he was talking about a moral invisible armor to protect them from the, uh, the negative moral effects that could happen from being in the military in the war. But soldiers at war need some form of creature comfort or distraction. The British and French soldiers certainly had theirs. The British soldiers had got their rum ration every day and the French soldiers had state-sponsored brothels where the, the, the Newton Baker and the United States government is not gonna truck with that. But they do allow cigarettes to uh, start being sold in the post exchange. That's right, cigarettes. Smoking became the American soldier's sanctioned vice during World War I. And the group in charge of providing the smokes? The YMCA. You know, history is often irony and tragedy, and that's one of the ironic things of history is one of the leading edge progressive organizations concerned with um, soldiers' health, morale, you know, morality, becomes one of the leading providers of the manufactured cigarettes starting in World War I. There were good reasons in 1917 to believe that cigarettes were the least worst option as far as soldiering vices, and they might even be helpful. Smoking a cigarette has a pharmacological effect. It causes the blood vessels to, in the, to constrict, and it has a, a bit of a you, you know, relaxing, calming uh, sensation to it. They're made to be smooth and desirable, deeply inhaled, and they, they give that relaxing uh, euphoria kind of feelings. Obviously, there's some stress involved in soldiering, especially in the type of trench warfare situation that many soldiers found themselves in when they got to Europe. If you've got jittery hands, uh, you know, and you're on the front lines and you're trying to shoot a, a rifle, smoking a cigarette and calming the hands is uh, something that you might want to have. And then there's also just boredom. The YMCA dispensed around two billion cigarettes to soldiers. Eventually, the army took over and included cigarettes in their standard ration. In total, around 7 billion cigarettes were distributed. And when the war ended, the soldiers returned victorious and with a new habit. After World War I, seeing all the doughboys smoking cigarettes, coming home with a cigarette in their mouth, um, continuing to smoke, it was considered manly, something that someone with very positive character and morals uh, engaged in. In fact, it was, uh, you know, a desirable kind of trade, you know, and what emerges is, is, hey, I can just put a cigarette in my mouth and I'm instantly considered masculine or, or manly. And so, thanks to the YMCA, the U.S. Army, and others, America emerged from World War I with millions of new and very manly nicotine addicts. And away we go in the 1920s and 30s to where by the time we get to World War II, uh, manufactured cigarette smoking is a normative behavior and a very profitable industry. Very profitable. So profitable that the government decided it needed to take a larger piece of the action from the pool of addicts it had helped create. So how is this for a tale of good intentions gone dreadfully wrong? The YMCA of all groups starts to hand out cigarettes to soldiers during the First World War. They want to make their struggle more manageable. Instead, they create an army of new addicts, addicts increasingly willing to fork over millions of their hard-earned dollars to the tobacco companies who make cigarettes and the governments that tax them. Once the harms of smoking become apparent, the Surgeon General and state governments step in to try to discourage the use of cigarettes. They pass even higher taxes in some states. But what does this accomplish? They create a massive opportunity for smugglers, organized crime, and terrorists one that continues until this day. Is there anything that can be done about this? And have we learned our lesson about when a virtuous act can actually lead to more vice? And what sorts of substances should we be handing out to our armed forces? That's next. According to Thomas Hall, there's only one foolproof way to curtail the massive cigarette smuggling we see today. If you want to take away the smuggling, the way you do it is you take away the profit opportunity. And to take away the profit opportunity is to take away these tax differentials. You'd get rid of, rid of a lot of the smuggling if every state and locality had the same cigarette tax. But how realistic is that anyway? 
that will probably never happen because you have totally different interest groups that work here. The, the tobacco producing states do not want high cigarette taxes. Uh, the tobacco consuming states are the ones who want that. So the Virginias and the North Carolinas and the Kentuckys and the Missouris of the world are not going to go along with this plan to equalize cigarette taxes because they know that that means raising their rates quite a bit. Joel Bias is also skeptical about cigarette tax reform. We're also uh, looking at a massively profitable industry that makes a lot of jobs, a lot of money, and a lot of tax receipts for local, state, and federal government. In other words, we can't expect either big tobacco or big government to change their stripes. But long term, says Hall, it won't matter. Fewer and fewer Americans as a proportion of the population eat your smoke. So it's this waning habit, and, and as it wanes, the smuggling opportunities will continue to diminish. They won't go away, but they will diminish. The percentage of Americans who smoke is at an all-time low, less than 15%. A half century ago, before the Surgeon General's report, that number was closer to 42%. But tobacco is not the only harmful substance we have to worry about. It's not even the only one threatening the ranks of the nation's military. Just as the Surgeon General once learned some disturbing truths about smoking, researchers today are learning some new ones about energy drinks. Back in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where authorities found our cigarette smugglers, there's another operation going on down the road at Fort Bragg. Just days after President Trump ordered the killing of Iran's top military leader, about 3,500 U.S. service members are now being deployed to the Middle East. And at times like these, volunteers and groups like the USO spring into action. Well, today, hundreds of community members came together to make care packages for military men and women. It's all part of a brigade created to care for those serving overseas. Donations are gathered and volunteers assemble for packing parties. About 400 people gathered in a church gym to bring donations, pack boxes, and write heartfelt letters. A wide variety of items can make it into the packages, from trail mix and toothpaste to socks and sunblock. Another item you often see? energy drinks. More than 500 cases of donated energy drinks were shipped off to troops in connection with the recent deployment from Fort Bragg. It's a well-intentioned gesture, but it's one that can lead to some devastating consequences. We were doing a study with soldiers. This is Dr. Amy Adler. She's a research psychologist with the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And we happen to have them in military classrooms, battalion classrooms, and they were sitting at their desks. And as we were handing out our surveys, we noticed that at the top of almost every soldier's desk were energy drinks. And just looking out across all the soldiers, it seemed really amazing to me and to the team that there were so many energy drinks present in the room. And why do soldiers drink so many energy drinks? You know, they want to perform at their best. They want to be able to function under conditions of restricted sleep. So energy drinks really offer an opportunity to kind of boost their performance when they are sleep deprived. And energy drink makers know they have a good market with soldiers. Even the packaging of brands like Rip It reflects why these drinks could be popular among soldiers. One can in camouflage, another in Stars and Stripes. Each can of Rip It also featuring a silhouette of an American hero on the battlefield. And it works. The energy drinks are enormously popular among soldiers. Maybe too popular. Amy Adler. More than 75% of the soldiers we surveyed reported drinking at least one energy drink sometime in the past month. And 29% said that they drank an energy drink daily. But the even more alarming number was the percentage of soldiers who had had two or more energy drinks per day. And that's one in six or 16 percent of the soldiers who we surveyed. So that's a sizable group and that's a lot of energy drinks. And consuming that amount had some consequences. So we found that for those soldiers drinking two or more energy drinks per day, that they were more than double at risk for reporting depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol misuse, and aggression, even after we controlled for things like rank and sleep problems. 
and one of the study's most surprising findings was related to sleep. Drinking high levels of energy drinks was associated actually with more fatigue and not less fatigue. That's right. Energy drinks made those who drank them even more tired. Now, there's no evidence to suggest that energy drinks are as harmful as cigarettes, but that shouldn't stop us from taking to heart the lessons of history. Just as their well-meaning counterparts in the YMCA distributed billions of cigarettes to soldiers a century ago, scores of earnest volunteers and army officials today are sending off crate after crate of energy drinks to soldiers. And we ought to know better than that by now. I think if people know about the risks, then they can make good decisions. And really, um, in terms of what the military can do, the military can can inform soldiers about the risk. They can inform healthcare providers about the risk. They can inform leaders. So leaders are armed with this kind of information. We still have time to do something about the problem of abusing energy drinks. We have the science and the lessons of history to guide us. But we really didn't have that luxury when we were confronted with cigarettes a century ago. You know, as much as I want to stand and judge and say, oh my gosh. Joel Bias again. We have to judge people for their own time, you know, and, and people will judge us as well, 100 to 200 years for, for, for our own time. People are products of their time, and so I think that that's the tragedy and the irony of history. What did we learn today about the tragedy and irony of history? One, the YMCA is responsible for more than just your local basketball league. Way more. Two, while the YMCA and the U.S. Army were handing out cigarettes to American soldiers in World War I, the French Army was operating state-sponsored brothels for its soldiers. That probably explains a lot of the difference between our two countries. Three, too many energy drinks can make you even more tired. And finally, if you want to save a lot of money and avoid sponsoring terrorism, don't smoke at all. Unless you're a doctor, of course. Flashback is written and hosted by me, Sean Braswell, senior writer and executive producer at Aussie. It was produced by Robert Kulos, Tracy Moran, Iorio de Gizua, and Shannon Williamson. Chris Hoff engineered our show. Special thanks to the crew at iHeartRadio Podcast Networks, especially Sophie Lichterman and Jack O'Brien. Make sure to subscribe to Flashback on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Flashback is the latest podcast from Aussie a modern media company producing original TV series, festivals, news, and podcasts for curious people. Ozzy's unique storytelling focuses on the new and the next, whether that's forward-looking news and features, bold new perspectives on TV, or brand new ways of looking at history. Here's one final thought from my lecture notes for this episode. Saddam Hussein's firstborn son, Uday, was a lot of things. A playboy, a rapist, a brutal killer, As head of Iraq's World Cup soccer team, he even tortured players who played badly. But there was perhaps one thing Uday was beyond all others, a cigarette smuggler. During the late 1990s and early 2000s, at a time when Iraq was under UN sanctions, he was pulling in up to $10 million per year for himself and his father's regime by trafficking in illegal cigarettes. Uday and his brother Kusei were killed by US forces in 2003, but you can still see Uday's gold-plated assault rifle today. Its location? The JFK Special Warfare Museum on Fort Bragg in Fayetteville, North Carolina. To dive deeper, head to ozzy.com slash flashback. That's ozy.com slash flashback. There you can find some of my lecture notes from today's episode, featuring extended interviews, links to further reading, and more information on the surprising history of cigarettes, as well as links to other hidden stories from history, uncovered by me and other reporters at Aussie. 